Fugacity. Just saying the word is enough to make a chemical engineering student flinch. You're told it's effective pressure, but no one really explains why we need it. In this video, I want to give you a counterargument that not only is it okay to be confused by fugacity, it's also okay to ignore it. Let's start by diving into the history of the term. In 1901, G.N. Lewis, the eminent American chemist, coined fugacity in his landmark paper The Law of Physicochemical Change. Remarkably, in that paper he made no direct reference to Gibbs' work on chemical potential, despite it being an influence for fugacity and published about 25 years ago. In contrast, most textbooks today correctly begin with chemical potential, then later introduce fugacity. So here's our plan. We'll start with Lewis's original perspective, setting Gibbs aside then circle back later, and explore how reframing the equations around fugacity can actually lead to conceptual confusion. Before we define fugacity, it's helpful to understand why such a concept is needed. Let's start with the ideal gas law, where P is pressure, V is molar volume, R is the gas constant, and T is temperature. If we plot PV slash RT against pressure, an ideal gas would trace a perfectly flat line at 1. But real gases behave differently. Hydrogen shows values slightly above 1, nitrogen dips just below, and carbon dioxide deviates the most. As we increase the pressure, these deviations grow significantly, highlighting how real gases depart from ideal behavior, especially under compression. Lewis recognized these shortcomings early on, yet many expressions continued relying on ideal gas assumptions. Let's consider vapor liquid equilibrium. At a given temperature and pressure, both phases coexist in balance. To describe how the pressure of the vapor phase changes with temperature, we turn to the Clapeyron equation. The left side shows the rate of change of vapor pressure with temperature. Delta HVAP is the latent heat of vaporization and VG minus VL is the difference in molar volumes between the vapor and liquid phases. To simplify the equation, we make a key assumption. The molar vapor volume is much larger than the molar liquid volume. So VG minus VL is approximately just VG. Then, assuming ideal gas behavior, we substitute VG as RT over P. This leads us to the familiar clausius clapeyron equation, relating the change in vapor pressure to temperature. In spite of these assumptions, the equation holds true for a variety of substances. But Lewis found this derivation mathematically absurd, although useful. That's why he introduced a new term to account for real gas behavior, but try to preserve the current form of ideal gas equations. In 1901, Lewis introduced fugacity and defined it with two conditions. First, it must have the same value for a species in any two phases at equilibrium. Second, in the ideal gas limit, when volume becomes very large and intermolecular interactions vanish, fugacity approaches the actual pressure. Lewis was clear that fugacity has the same units as pressure, but it carries more physical meaning in non-ideal conditions. He likely believed fugacity was a fundamental property of substances. However, as we'll soon see, tethering it to pressure can keep it from truly generalizing. Before we delve into those issues, let's quickly look at the usefulness of the concept. Revisiting the clausius clapeyron equation we introduced before, which is derived under the assumption of ideal gas behavior. By replacing pressure with fugacity, Lewis obtained equations of similar mathematical form that remain valid beyond the ideal gas limit. Arriving at this result without invoking the Gibbs equation is mathematically non-trivial. The strength of fugacity lies in this consistency. It preserves familiar differential relationships while extending their applicability to real gases. Additionally, because fugacity retains the same units as pressure, it remains physically interpretable. Importantly, the condition for phase equilibrium implies that fugacity can, in principle, be calculated for liquids and solids. Let's talk about how we determine the fugacity of a liquid from vapor-liquid equilibrium. By definition at equilibrium, the F liquid equals the F vapor. We can often get F vapor directly from an equation of state or from experimental data. But what if our liquid barely evaporates? Then the vapor phase is essentially missing and F vapor is undefined. So how do we get the liquid's fugacity now? This is where Lewis introduced activity. Instead of relying on a non-existent vapor, we switch to an activity-based framework. Remember, Fugacity carries units of pressure, while activity has units of concentration. Different units, same goal, account for non-ideality. 
I will not go through the tedious task of defining activity without mentioning Gibbs. My possibly unpopular take, fugacity and activity are clever mathematical conveniences, not fundamental properties. They're useful, but they often feel like patches over conceptual gaps. Now finally, we'll do the opposite. Set fugacity aside and bring in Gibbs's truly general idea, the chemical potential, mu. Gibbs defines mu as the rate of change of a system's energy when an infinitesimal amount of species I is added or removed with the appropriate variables held fixed. It's the energetic price per particle. If the relevant energy is the Gibbs free energy, then mu is the partial derivative of G with respect to Ni at constant temperature and pressure. Change the constraints and you change the potential, same mu new derivative. At constant temperature and volume, it's derivative of Helmholtz energy A with del and I. At constant entropy and volume, it's derivative of internal energy U with del and I. Different thermodynamic potentials, different variables locked, but same physical meaning. In what follows, we'll stick with the Gibbs free energy definition because temperature and pressure are much easier to control experimentally, making our conclusions more physically meaningful. Let's derive the phase equilibrium condition directly from Gibbs free energy. Consider two coexisting phases, alpha and beta, with chemical potentials mu alpha and mu beta. If we transfer an infinitesimal amount of species, I from beta to alpha at constant T and P, the total Gibbs free energy change is equal to dG alpha plus dG beta. Based on our definitions, we can simplify this equation where dG equal to mu alpha minus mu beta into dNi. At equilibrium, any allowed infinitesimal transfer should not change for arbitrary dn. This requires dg equals zero, implying mu alpha equals mu beta. Intuitively, if mu alpha is less than mu beta, matter would spontaneously flow from beta to alpha to lower g until the potentials equalize. Thus, we derive the condition for chemical equilibrium from the fundamental thermodynamic equations. Let's clear the board and keep only the result we derived by minimizing g at fixed temperature and pressure. Now let's bring back the fugacity condition for equilibrium. But remember, this equality of fugacities is by definition of phase equilibrium, whereas the equality of chemical potentials was derived from the Gibbs free energy argument. So, we can already see why chemical potential is conceptually more robust than fugacity. Lewis recognized the shortcomings of fugacity. The only benefit it had is that it preserved the ideal gas equations for real gases, but it's a constructed property and not a fundamental one. He faced a choice. Abandoned fugacity since its main appeal is preserving ideal gas algebra is an arguably arbitrary requirement or anchor it to the fundamental chemical potential. He chose the latter, redefining fugacity through mu and haunting future chemical engineering students with this concept. To better understand how Lewis linked fugacity to chemical potential, we need to understand how chemical potential changes with pressure which we will subsequently replace with fugacity. An important point to note is that chemical potential is partial molar property for a species. Its absolute zero is arbitrary. Only differences between states, whether in pressure, temperature, composition, or phase have physical meaning. To make those dependencies explicit, we begin with the fundamental differential equation for the Gibbs free energy, whose natural variables are T and P. Applying Maxwell relations separates the pressure and temperature responses of chemical potential. The first relation shows how it changes with pressure, while the second captures its temperature dependence. Focusing on pressure alone, we hold temperature constant so that the partial derivatives reduce to ordinary differentials. Substituting the definition of the partial molar volume for an ideal gas, we arrive at the familiar logarithmic expression for the pressure dependence of chemical potential. Now that we've covered both the theoretical tools and the historical baggage, we are ready to define fugacity as it appears in modern textbooks and as it's commonly introduced to undergraduate chemical engineers. We begin with the pressure dependence of chemical potential that we derived earlier. For clarity and generalization, we use partial pressure instead of total pressure. This choice not only reflects real gas mixtures more accurately, but also anticipates the later introduction of activity. At this point, Lewis made a pivotal move. He simply replaced pressure P with fugacity F in the ideal gas expression. This substitution gives us the new formal definition of fugacity.
from this new definition, we recover a key property. The condition for equilibrium can now be expressed directly in terms of fugacity. This is derived from the chemical potential, not as a new assumption, but as a consequence. However, one crucial condition remains. In the limit of ideal gas behavior, fugacity must approach the actual pressure. This ensures we preserve the form of the ideal gas equations, which I will repeat is a completely arbitrary requirement for gases. Now, let's address some common misconceptions regarding fugacity. Firstly, the confusion arises from the fact that both chemical potential and fugacity represent the contribution of species, I, in a particular phase. But they're not the same. Chemical potential is a partial molar quantity. Fugacity is not a partial molar derivative of any thermodynamic potential, and there is no potential F that decomposes as F equal to sigma FINI. Secondly, the units of mu I are energy per mole. On the other hand, fugacity has units of pressure. Therefore, mu I applies universally to all phases. Fugacity is most natural for gases. Therefore, in condensed phases it loses practical meaning. So while both help describe how a species contributes to a system, fugacity is limited in its applicability. The second misconception concerns fugacity's relationship to pressure. Fugacity is not pressure or real pressure. Consider an illustrative example with a hypothetical quantity K that depends only on pressure P. Assume that for an ideal gas, K varies linearly with P. However, as shown here in yellow, the real points deviate from this ideality, especially at high pressure. To resolve this issue, we introduce fugacity F and define K equal to F into C. When plotted this way, the real points fall on the line by construction. However, the non-ideality has not disappeared. It has been absorbed into how F varies with P. In an FP plot, only an ideal gas lies on F equal to P. Thus, fugacity is a thermodynamic construct, not pressure itself. At fixed temperature and composition, it is a function of pressure, equaling pressure only in the ideal limit. So, what should we remember? First, chemical potential is a fundamental thermodynamic quantity. It tells us how the Gibbs free energy changes when we add or remove a species. At equilibrium, chemical potential must be equal across phases. That's not a definition that's a consequence of thermodynamic laws. In the case of an ideal gas, chemical potential depends on pressure through a simple logarithmic relationship, and that form is incredibly useful. To preserve this form for real gases, we introduce fugacity, a mathematical construction. Fugacity replaces pressure in the logarithmic expression, allowing us to carry over the ideal gas algebra even when the gas is non-ideal. For real gases, mu involves an integral over the molar volume with respect to pressure. Fugacity just equates that integral to the logarithmic expression derived for ideal gases. So the non-ideality of real gases hasn't vanished but hidden in F versus P relationship. Finally, since phase equilibrium requires equal chemical potentials, it follows by definition that fugacity must also be equal across phases. And that brings us to the end. I hope this journey clarified more than it confused. Thanks for watching, and may your chemical potentials be always minimized.